Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Between the Lines, Between the Line Items, Understanding and Reporting on Local Budgets, an event sponsored by the New England chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. My name is Stella Lawrence, and we're joined here tonight with um, our distinguished panelist, Ted Nisi. <laughs> I sorry, I was muted, and I didn't want to do that Zoom thing where you're still muted. Uh, it's all good. I have a, a quick, I have your bio. I'll uh, I'll give you the, the oh formal boy. introduction. Um, Ted Nisi joined the 12 News team, that's WPRI in Providence, Rhode Island. He joined in July of 2010 and is now politics and business editor, as well as a Target 12 investigative reporter. Ted writes the weekly Nisi's Notes column on Saturdays and co-hosts Newsmakers. In 2017, he won a New England Emmy Award for investigative reporting. And before job during Woo. Before joining WPRI 12, Ted spent two years as a reporter and editor at Providence Business News. He got his start as a reporter with his hometown daily paper, The Sun Chronicle, in Attleboro, Massachusetts, where he covered local government and wrote a weekly column. Uh, not sure if you can tell that I am the print journalist here, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we will turn it over for some tips and tricks on covering budgets. Yeah, Stella, thank you for having me. Um, and I actually, you know, as nerdy as it sounds, I love budget coverage. Um, as my current and former colleagues can all attest, I think it's obviously it's important journalistically, but I also think there's so many good stories, um, not just about budgets, but in budgets. Um, so I think it's really something useful. And I, uh, Stella sent me some questions and thoughts on things to touch on. So I'm just going to kind of bounce through some of the topics she suggested, and I'm just going to riff a little um, about uh, what came to mind for me. So um, first question uh, I had was the kinds of budget stories an editor might ask for and when. Um, so it, you know, I, I, I'm going to step back from that first to say, you've got to get comfortable with numbers <laughs> as a reporter. I don't think just as a, as a budget reporter either. I think just generally speaking, you know, why did we all become reporters? Probably not because we were calculus majors or whatever. Like we like words, we like uh, communication numbers can be scary. Um, but the numbers, the like comfort with numbers you need to do budget coverage is usually basically arithmetic and not too much more, you know, plus minus. And frankly, if you can't follow the numbers that that's actually also a question for the jurisdiction you're covering, because it shouldn't be that hard to follow money in money out where it's going. Um, so get comfortable with numbers, it will pay dividends. Um, basic Excel is your friend. Um, again, you don't have to be a spreadsheet wizard, but like my colleague Eli Sherman is, but um, just knowing how to just use that to quickly do, um, you know, subtraction and addition for you, et cetera, percentages, things like that, that can really make it quicker and clearer for you to see a, a story in the numbers. Um, generally speaking, budget coverage is simpler than you think, which doesn't mean it's easily. Um, I think the, 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 the uh, tempo of budgets is something that should be pretty easy to find out. Every jurisdiction has a fiscal year start date. Most places it's July 1st. Obviously it's for the feds, it's November 1st. There are cities and towns um, like East Providence, Rhode Island that start a different time of year. But so you want to find out when's our fiscal year start and end in this jurisdiction. Um, and then you can usually back out from there uh, when the budget process usually starts. And you can just ask somebody. You can probably look at your own institution's prior coverage to see when did the mayor or the city manager or whoever it's going to be first introduce the budget. I'm going to focus mostly on, I'm going to focus on municipal budgets. Most of it also would apply to a state budget, but there's also just vastly more municipalities. So I feel like it's more likely someone would be covering a municipal budget, especially if you haven't done a lot of budget coverage. Um, do you want to learn that rhythm? What's the process? When is it usually introduced? I've, and it's different in all different places. Um, when is it usually introduced? When do you get the first version? Whoever initiates the process, the mayor often, for example. Well, then when do you get the next version? Is there a city council revision after the behind the scenes negotiations? When roughly can you expect that? Most places, there's some kind of calendar that the political actors have in their head, even though it can slide. Um, because obviously things happen, um, but you just want to get a sense of that calendar so you have that in your own mind. What are the moments throughout the year? And there can be ones you you don't just think about when the actual budget documents are introduced. In Rhode Island, for example, um, 
Some of the dates I keep in my mind are November and May, because that's when we get revenue and spending updates, which isn't the budget introduction, but it's setting the, the table for the budget, right? Is the budget on track from this current year? Is next year's budget going to be in trouble? Is there going to be a windfall, et cetera? So there's dates all through the budgeting is a constant process. So there's dates all through the year. And the more you're kind of keeping track of the process that way, the easier I think it'll be. Um, remember when you're writing a story about the budget that the process should not be your lead. This is true of anything we do in news, but you know, it's so easy for reporters to get caught in the the mayor introduced the budget tonight, uh, the city council debated the revised budget tonight. You know, you, it, what's it, very few people are that interested that last night was the budget meeting. What they want to know is, are my taxes going up? Did they spend something? Are they fighting over a specific line item? It's it's it might sound obvious as you hear that, but it, it's so easy for people to fall out of that and just write the budget procedural story where you lose a lot of people. You know, what's the most interesting thing you heard? And that's a judgment call. Um, oh, and the other big picture point I had was, um, you know, the legislative body, if you're in a jurisdiction that has one, usually will know the pain points. So obviously, if, a, if you're in a place with a mayor, the mayor's going to introduce the budget, tell you it's the best budget ever. Here's all the wonderful things I'm spending money on. Here's your taxes aren't high or they're going down, whatever. Um, they're probably not going to tell you like, here's the, now if the mayor signals something they don't like in the budget, you know, you have a story because they're trying to defend it up front, but often they won't tell you about things, but then maybe the council, if there's a city or town council where you are knows, Hey, uh, this part of the budget, uh, we've been watching the police spending and it soared, or what is she doing on property taxes? Or why didn't they include more money for this or whatever? So those, uh, legislators on a council can be really helpful to you in letting you know, what are the stories the mayor's office isn't telling you that you all should be paying attention to? Um, so another question I had was, um, and I see professors here, nice to see you uh, uh, here in the Zoom. Um, another question I had, if you're on deadline, what's the first thing you look at? What are the most important parts to look at? Um, first thing I'd say is I remember early in my time at the Sun Chronicle and again at Channel 12 when I got here, um, I spent some of my own time, and I know that's a debate we all constantly have to have with ourselves, how much to put our own time into our reporting when we should be getting paid for our work, but we also know sometimes you have to invest in yourself. I spent some of my own time sort of slowly going through budget documents, um, like the prior years, just to get familiar with it. You know, what's in the document? Where is the different information provided? Um, how does this city or town... Uh, describe it because you you can find a lot in there. I think um, the professor is going to talk about CAFRs and the annual reports, the audits that they bring out. But those those are great because they're they're not for you; they're for bondholders, <laughs> and so they lay everything out pretty clearly. Usually, or they're supposed to. So those can also be really useful. Um, in general, if I'm on deadline with a budget story, start with the basics. How big is the proposed budget? Did it go up or down from last year? Um, if there might be a difference between how much they want to spend versus how much revenue is coming in, is the revenue going to go up? How much? Because that means someone's going to pay that increase in revenue, probably taxpayers. Um, and then if I have more time, go to the departments. You know, what? Uh, which department's getting an increase? Which department might be getting a decrease? Uh, which one has an out-of-line increase compared to the others? Does somebody's budget shrink? And then again, if you have even more time, what did the mayor campaign on or town counselors? What are, what's the town talking about? What are people saying is the pain points? Is that addressed in the budget? Um, what is the thing the mayor or whoever is, is highlighting most in the budget? You know, that obviously is also a guide. The mayor touted their tax cuts or whatever, new investments. Um, so some of it's, again, pretty obvious. You know, you kind of follow the lead of what the numbers show you and what you're hearing from officials. Um, Another question I had, what kind of sources help you report on the budget? Um, and how do you incorporate outside analysis? It really depends on the size of the jurisdiction you're in, right? Um, and I think for people listening to this, the toughest places to cover a budget are often small, medium-sized towns um, because, you know, just by their nature of small jurisdictions, they probably don't have like think tanks uh, covering municipal government down there. Um, you might not even have a true like uh, mayor council type dynamic with some healthy tension that can also help you to understand pain points. If it's a, like when I started out, I was in Norton, Massachusetts, you had the board of selectmen, which hired the town manager who was kind of the executive branch, quote unquote. Well, he worked for them. So they weren't really going to be usually at loggerheads. Sometimes it happens, but 
wasn't that kind of thing. So it's just tough in a small jurisdiction, um, but you can still look for, is there an outspoken local who always writes into the paper? Doesn't mean they are an oracle and is gonna tell you everything you have to vet what they tell you, but they might flag something to you that is interesting. Um, is there someone who was previously in office who knows the budget very well and can uh, point you to this or that? Are there um, state uh, legislators, perhaps, or their staff who might have a, be following the budget for their own reasons and have their own thoughts? You know, who else might have some expertise? Think outside the box on that um, and, and see what you can get. You also want to think about what can you do in advance, right? If you know the budget's going to be unveiled a certain day or a certain evening, um, first, can you get an embargoed copy? Um, can you get it early so you can spend some time with it uh, before you're getting up to your deadline? Um, can you get any off the record hints about what's good, what's bad, what's going to be controversial, what they're excited about in the executive side of things? Um, can you just talk to people early? What's the council expecting if you have one, that kind of thing? Um, and I had the question, if you get more time, what are some other components you can look at? Um, pensions comes right to mind to me. That's been a huge issue in Rhode Island. It's an issue in Massachusetts as well. I can't speak for the other states in New England. Um, it takes a little time to get used to the kind of funky actuarial math of pensions. But again, spending some basic time getting familiar with it, you can find stories there. You know, how much are those costs growing? In Providence, it's growing so much, it's eating up much of the revenue growth every year just to put more money into the pension fund because it's so underfunded. Um, similar with debt, you know, has the city or town taken on a lot of debt for, you know, they just build a new high school. Um, they're trying to do a community center, something like that. That's always good to watch. Um, I'd also say I just, when I was um, starting out, I, I I didn't always think through um, like on the line items, you might see small changes, but until that's why the Excel is helpful. Cause if you can plug in and you realize that some little departments getting a hundred percent increase, someone's getting a job, <laughs> right? So maybe you go find out who you want to hire over in the tax assessor's office for your cousin's nephew's friend, because there was at a campaign, fund, right? You can find stuff like that in there too. Um, uh, right now too, I'd be looking at ARPA, 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 right? The Fed sent all that American Rescue Plan Act money up to the city, the cities and towns and the school districts. Um, I just know when a lot of money flows in fast, uh, there's a lot of room for, there's room for mischief sometimes, there's room for just questionable decisions. Also, it can be a chance for transformation, right? Maybe something really good gets funded with it. But that's really, it's really important that all of us budget reporters are scrutinizing how this big one-time infusion, Mayor Mitchell in New Bedford told me, it's definitely the biggest infusion of federal funds, New Bedford, since it's a great society, maybe since FDR and the New Deal. Like that's the amount of money and how unusual this is we're talking about. So where is the money? If you don't know where the ARPA budget is going in your city or town, find out and find out if how they're handing that out because that money is important and it will be gone. Um, and last thing, and then I'll hand it back to Stella. What have you learned over the years from doing stories like this? And what do you wish you knew when you started out? So much. Um, the... The biggest thing I thought of when I looked at that question was I was too shy and insecure and intimidated as a young reporter. It's always going to be a little bit like that. You are inevitably a 22, 23 year old with much older people who are elected and, you know, know their way around stuff. But you got to fight through that. Ask the questions that you need answers. Acknowledge what you don't know yet because you are inevitably someone who just got out of school and is trying to figure this out for the first time. Um, just be ready to do that. And I, I alluded to it before, but I'll just say again, I actually think audits are more interesting than budgets because you have final numbers and you also have a lot of disclosures. You know, the state audit and round, I always go, first thing I do, I, when I get it, I go right to the section where they have to disclose like material problems that aren't elsewhere in the audit, like lawsuits. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes bondholders rule all in municipal finance, I've learned. And so uh, they have to tell them everything. So sometimes there's information that the city doesn't want to, or town doesn't want to give you, that they've had to quietly put on page 150 of the audit because they're legally obligated to, but they're not going to tell you. So the only way to find that out is to go through the audit in the same way you go through the budget. So well, I won't deny that these things can be intimidating at first, big numbers, lots of pages of documents often, but Investing that time up front to get a little more comfortable with these documents will pay you permanent dividends rather than always waiting for a budget document to drop in your head as if it's the first time and just, you know, white knuckle it. I would recommend that time up front. 
um, getting a little more comfortable with it. And, and who knows what stories you'll find. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, we're going to pause here and see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, you can also feel free, didn't mention this before, but you can also feel free to put those in the chat at any time and we can work to get those answered. So pausing now for, for questions. I have one actually. Um, you mentioned pain points a couple of times as, as good stories and that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of consistent with what you learn and in J school or you know out on initially that that inherent conflict that's what makes a good story how do you find those pain points is that just talking to people seeing what they're bringing up when you ask those questions yeah i think it's it's there's no shortcut to it right um i think some of it's hopefully if you get some time on a beat you just start to know the things that are coming up a lot the problems that are happening um, hopefully, if you're working at a publication that gets some reader input, whether on social media or in uh, in in you know letters to the editor, or however that works, um, you can kind of see are there things coming up a lot. Obviously, those community Facebook groups are a double-edged sword, but they can certainly tip you off to things that are happening. Um, and then, yeah, people. We are in the people business in journalism in the end, and talk. You know, there's just nothing that can beat relationships with people who know things and are willing to tell them to you. So, getting to know the members of the council, um, demonstrating your seriousness. I think a lot, especially with younger reporters, a lot of officials, um, you know, want to make sure that you really care about this, and you're not just going to, you know, cover them for a month and then be gone, and you don't really care. So, showing, investing the time, doing the work, I think all that makes a difference. But yeah, just being kind of heads up, and also consuming what came before you in your own market, right? Or your own publication. So a lot of reporters get plopped into a new place and, you know, they have the born yesterday problem because they haven't spent enough time maybe trying to read what, you know, someone was covering this jurisdiction before you. What were they, you know, what were their stories the last six months, 12 months? What were, what were they writing a year ago when the last budget happened, right? Some of that, it's obvious stuff, but we can forget to do it. So all those different tricks of the trade, um, I think, are important. And of course, hopefully, if you have editors or colleagues or even people at nearby publications you get along with, ask them, ask everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm now going to turn it over, invite um, Dr. Nancy Fang to the floor. A uh, quick introduction here. Um, Nancy Fang is a professor of accounting and business law at Suffolk University. Um, her primary interest, her primary primary research interests lie in the field of nonprofit and governmental accounting, auditing, and financial accounting. She published in top-tier accounting journals, including the Journal of Accounting and Public Policy, Accounting Horizons, Journal of Accounting, Auditing, and Finance, Issues in Accounting Education, and the Journal of Governmental and Nonprofit Accounting, as well as high-quality journals such as Tax Notes, State Tax Notes, JPBAFM, Research and Accounting Regulation, and Current Issues in Auditing. She is a recipient of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board Gill Crane Memorial Research Grant and has, re and has won research grants from Suffolk University as well. Um, feel free to put any questions in the chat and I will turn it over to Nancy. Thank you, uh, Stella. Um, sorry, you know, uh, for being late. Um, I got caught up with something, you know. Um, and so, uh, just based on my understanding today, um, uh, first, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, give this uh, talk. And uh, I think uh, today's focus, if uh, if I understand clearly, uh, just briefly um, use the city of Boston as an example to go over the annual comprehensive financial report, right? So um, just to get the, some uh, basic un understanding of the structure, of the report and the meaning of the major components or accounts on those statements. Absolutely, um, we're looking forward to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, first I would like to just uh, briefly discuss the major components or the structure of the annual comprehensive uh, uh, financial report of a city or local government. So um, there are three uh, major components. The first one is the basic financial uh, statements and also notes. So basic financial statements include um, like a two groups of the statements. The first group is governmental wide statements, for example, city of Boston, right? And then 
the second group of the financial statements are the uh, the fund financial statements. Like you know, each government has different sub entities. Those called funds, um, like a general fund, right? Um, uh, like uh, the government-wide funds, right? Uh, proprietary funds, fiduciary funds, right? So, so they each fund is like sub entity, and the, each fund has its own set of self-balanced financial statements. Those called fund uh, financial statements. And um, besides these basic financial statements, uh, footnotes, financial footnotes are also a very important uh, part of the financial reporting. So this is the, the first, the biggest p uh, component of the annual comprehensive uh, financial report. The second uh, uh, component is, uh, it's called MD&A, that's a abbreviation, uh, which represents uh, management discussion and analysis. So typically this component uh, include the, um, management's discussion, the managers of the city or local government, um, their view of uh, the entities, um, high, um, like high level overview of uh, their performance. Uh, usually they start with the highlights of the performance. Then they talk about some challenges of, uh, they're facing. And uh, then sometimes they include the uh, predictions of you know what's coming and sometimes they include some budgeting information and the third major components include the other required supplementary information RSI that's typically uh, people refer to and uh, inside other RSI uh, one important piece information is the budgetary comparison uh, typically has the final budget and then actual spending and then the variance, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, right? Like if we spend less than what we budgeted, then we have favorable uh, variance. And then um, then we have uh, previous year's budget as a comparative. So that's called a budgetary comparative uh, schedule. And so that's included in other uh, required supplementary uh, information. Um, and uh, government-wide statement typically use accrual basis of accounting. You know, I'm not sure that everyone has the accounting background, but uh, um, accrual basis means that uh, we recognize revenue um, when when the uh, when we provide goods and services not necessarily at a time when we receive cash uh, or uh, yeah so and then um that's that's for revenue recognition and for um, expense recognition and we uh, re uh, recognize recognize means we record we log the expenses when they incur uh, not necessarily when we pay the cash payments so that's accrual basis you know versus the cash cash basis right and then uh, for governmental uh, entities uh, there's a, a, another basis of accounting which is called a modified accrual basis um, which focuses more on uh, currently available financial resources meaning that uh, you know for example uh, when the city want to recognize revenue and uh, not only we have to provide the services, that's a crew basis, right? Crew basis means, you know, we recognize revenue after we provide goods and services, regardless we receive the cash or not, right? Modified crew basis means we uh, provide goods and service. And also we either received cash um, payments from the clients within the year, or within uh, three months, shortly after the fiscal year end. So uh, you can see there's a timeline, right? There's like really focus on the you know currently available financial resources, and similarly, uh, expense ex 
you know, in modified approved basis, expenses are called expenditures. So it's it's interesting convention. So those uh, and and uh, governmental fund um, state uh, statements use modified accrual basis, but proprietary funds, fiduciary funds use accrual basis, which make the um, the annual comprehensive financial reporting a little bit complicated compared to you know other like for profit accounting uh, or compared to non profit accounting. So let me open up the, so this is high level overview of the structure of the annual comprehensive, uh, comprehensive financial reporting. Let me um, share the screen of the city of Boston uh, annual report so we can go over some of the major statements together. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's looking good. Okay, great. So this is the, uh, City of Boston statement, um, annual comprehensive uh, financial report of uh, for the fiscal year ended um, on June uh, 30th, 2021. So, and on the right top, uh, right hand top corner, um, you can see government wide financial statement, right? You see the, the um, so that this indicates this is consolidated entity-wide statement, uh, which uses uh, accrual basis of accounting. And uh, on the left-hand side, you see the title of the statement, statement of net position. So this is a, a statement equivalent to uh, balance sheet for full profit um, and the statement of net assets for non-profit organization. So just if you draw a, a Analogy, kind of analogy to you know what other, uh, I mean the the similar statements for other um, counterparts in for profit and non profit. Now this statement uh, tells us the this statement actually uh, take a picture of the entity's financial position on a particular day. In this case, the day is which day? June 30th, 2021. So on that day, on that end of the fiscal year, and then we took picture of city of Boston financial position. So this, this is what this statement uh, tells us. Now, the structure of the statement of net position, uh, two major parts, assets, you see assets, Plus deferred outflow of resources. Uh, that's that's um, uh, that's the um, le on the left hand side. And I think this is just because it's uh, so big. So <laughs> they actually um, run through the second page. If we if we put the statement together. Typically, it's assets on the left hand side, and then liabilities and uh, net position on the right hand side, and that's why, um, you know, in the for profit account, it's called a balance sheet, right? Because two sides need to be balanced, um, and this actually the reason it's called a balance sheet is because two sides, one is debit side, the other is credit side, right? And we we can you know. Uh, for the sake of time, we can't really go into the details of you know all the transactions, debits, uh, credits, and that's um, all uh, traced back to double entry bookkeeping. You know, uh, back to the Renaissance age. Um, so assets uh, represent what the resources that entity has, the resources that can uh, help the entity to um, realize revenues, the, the future economic benefits, right? So they, they can utilize this asset to generate future benefits. So typically, you know, uh, what we can see here, uh, assets, um, here we have current assets, meaning that, you know, they can be liquidated very quickly. They, we can sell and convert cash very quickly. And typically one year is 
the, the timeline. And then there are some non-current assets, um, meaning that the, you know, the, the holding term is more than one, one year. And then there's capital assets. Capital assets typically we call fixed assets. Those like you know, uh, some equipment, right? Um, machine, machines, buildings, right? Those are the capital assets. Um, and then deferred offshore resources. And uh, this means that we actually, we as entity, the city of Boston actually will um, uh, distribute this to another entity, but they cannot use it until next accounting period. That's why it's called deferred outflow of resources. Um, so Gatsby actually, um, in recent years, the Gatsby actually asked um, the entity to separate, you know, it used to be included as part of assets, but now as part of the, the like the um, items in inside assets, but now they actually, Gatsby asked this component to be um, uh, put outside assets, but still on the left hand side. So left hand side, the total would be assets plus deferred outflow resources. Now on the right hand side, um, on the top we have liabilities. Liability means what we owe to others. Um, so again, uh, it has a timeline. You know, if if it's due within one year, typically that's current asset, a uh, current liability. And uh, if it's due beyond uh, one year, and then that's non-current liabilities. Mm. Oftentimes. We can see large uh, non-current liability include pension, right? Pension liability that's uh, non-time mortgage payable, right? Uh, bonds payable, right? So, so, um, so those are the non-current liabilities, and also uh, there's a deferred inflow of resources, um, and that that was previously included in the liabilities, but the Gatsby ask uh, entities to uh, put it outside uh, liabilities. And this refers to what? This refers to, uh, for example, cash advance that the city of Boston received, but um, cannot, uh, actually cannot be uh, utilized or recognized as revenue until next accounting period. So, um, so like, you know, if they receive um, some tax payments in advance, right? That's deferred inflow of resources. They cannot recognize revenue until the next tax year if the, if, if the payment is for the next uh, tax, uh, tax year payment. And then the second component on the right hand, uh, right hand side is called net position. And that is uh, typically the uh, financial cushions that the city has. And uh, uh, net position can be restricted or non, uh, unrestricted. Unrestricted means there's no uh, restriction or strings attached to it. Um, here we actually don't see a lot, but in, in nonprofit organizations, we know nonprofit actually receive a lot of donations, right? Sometimes the donors actually have strings attached with the uh, uh, donations. And so you can clearly see in the in the nonprofit statements uh, they'll have um, restricted, temporarily restricted or permanently restricted um, net assets, you know, for nonprofits. And here um, we only have restrictions uh, for other purpose uh, or capital projects, meaning that uh, the government actually set aside uh, some resources and to get ready to acquire. Uh, capital assets, right? The capital project or um, to fix the, uh, the, you know, to fix the library, for example, to um, to help in the school system, right? This type of big uh, projects. So that's, uh, so uh, for this statement of net position, assets plus deferred outflow of resources equal to liability plus deferred inflow of resources plus net position. So that's the relationship of these components. Uh, and uh, you can see from, from this 
2021 uh, City of Boston um, accounting, I mean, um, report, you can, you can see that uh, the, uh, they actually list the two uh, columns, primary government, and then um, this include the governmental activities and then discreetly presented component units. So governmental, uh, for primary governments, these are the, um, these are the main government uh, body. They have, uh, they, uh, they have their own financial resources. For component units, uh, these are legally separate uh, unit, but however, financially they actually re rely on the primary government, like the city of Boston. Um, the governmental activities refer to a lot of, you know, uh, activities, the main government, the city of Boston governments, right? And then the, the uh, for example, the public works, right? Like, you know, when snow day, uh, the city actually sends out the uh, snow plow uh, trucks, right? And um, uh, police stations, right? Uh, fire stations, you know, this type of activities. Um, Okay, yeah, so so uh, similarly, the liabilities also has uh, the separate columns. The next statement is statement of activities. Again, on the right, uh, right hand top corner, we can see a governmental wide statement. So this is still entity wide statement. Statement of activities, um, the equivalent statement in for profit is called income statement. Um, and uh, the nonprofit uh, equivalent statement is called statement of activities, it's the same uh, title. And if you notice the timestamp uh, for this one is year ended June 30th, 2021. So statement of activity is a video, it's not a snapshot. If you recall the statement on that position, the timestamp is just one day. That's the picture, the static picture of financial position, right? Statement of activity is a video. This video tells us how well the entity performs over the period. So how well the city of Boston performs over the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021. So that's what the, uh, the statement is trying to tell us. Now, this statement, again, <laughs> the governmental statement is huge. Uh, what we can see here, right, um, uh, it's only part of the, yeah, see, you see the, the two pages together uh, actually give us the whole picture of the statements. Um, so we, we really need to put them side by side. Um, not sure I can do that, but I think you know it's probably better to show page by page because if I put them together, it'll be too small to see the font. So let's look at this uh, the structure. Uh, you actually can see from here there are two panels: there are top panel and there's bottom panel, right? So the top panel record the revenues, the program revenues, meaning what? The revenue derived from the programs or functions that listed on the left-hand side. You see from primary government, right? This is actually tells us what exactly the government activities, right? The general government, the human HR, public safety, public works, property and the, you know, parks, recreation, library, schools, public health, uh, interest on long-term debt, right? So this is the primary government activities. Um, and then the component units, they give us, you know, the component units. Remember they are legally separate units, but they financially rely on the primary government, right? Example is public, Boston Public Health Commission, right? That's one of the example. Now the first column, expenses. Expenses, um, you know, for primary governmental activities, also for component units. Then this next the group of columns, 
under the program revenues. So uh, that includes charges for services. Uh, that means, for example, general government provides services for other uh, entities, then the, char the charge for services, uh, $48 million. Right? Everyone see that number? Because the unit of measure, the amount uh, are installments, right? So that's $48 million. And then the second uh, um, column is operating grants and uh, uh, contributions. So that that means uh, the city of Boston received some grants and contributions that used for operating uh, purpose. And then capital grants and uh, contributions. That means the city of Boston received some grants and contribution uh, contributions towards um, uh, fixing the capital assets, for example, right? For capital projects. So uh, that's the meaning of these uh, columns. Now, remember, actually, we still have the other half of the, uh, the panel on the next uh, page, right? So I'm going to scroll down to see. So everyone see this? This is actually should uh, sit next to um, the program revenue on the top panel. Uh, so the next group of the has a two next group of columns have two columns under the net revenues and changes in net position um, and separate government activities and component component units. So how do we derive the negative uh, $66 million? Remember here is that net, right? Net expense or revenue and changes in that position. So this means we use program revenue, subtract the expenses. Remember that's what we saw from the previous page, right? So this is the net. And if, if you look at, for governmental activities, if you look at these numbers, there's a striking characteristic. Do you see? It's what? It's like all in red, right? We have huge expenses and the expense, I mean, the, the net, uh, in this case, we call it a deficit, right? Uh, the expense is actually um, much larger than the program revenues, right? So uh, we actually have uh, three billion, right? Three billion deficit. Um, you wonder, wow, <laughs> that's a lot, right? Um, and that's why the governmental activities actually are listed separately because people's expectation for um, governmental activities are different for, uh, from the business-like activities because government, government provide all the public services, right? So uh, people don't expect the governments to um, Earn a lot of profits. You know that's you know that's more uh, understandable, right? Um, and so so this is the top panel. Now I I'm going to go back to the previous page because we haven't uh, go over the the bottom panel, right? So I want to go over uh, the bo bottom panel. So everyone see the bottom panel. So. Um, yeah, unfortunately, they only have the you know the the title of the counts here, but then the numbers in the second page, right? So we have to uh, really in our mind to put the, the two pieces together, right? Um, so the bottom panel actually represents the general revenues. General revenues include what taxes? You know, city of Boston have taxes, right? Property tax, uh, exercise tax. Uh, Payments in lieu of taxes, for example, uh, some you know nonprofit universities they don't pay a property tax, right? In lieu of the tax, then they send some payments to the city of Boston. Um, grants contributions not re uh, restricted investment income that's the return on investment, and city appropriation that's the appropriation the budgetary the the approved budgets that are uh, given to the city of Boston. Uh, and there's some miscellaneous items 
um, and special items gain on sale of property. That means city of Boston sold some property, right? Sold some buildings and that's a gain. A gain means we sold, uh, sold the property above its book value, right? Um, and then total general revenue. And then use total general revenue. We can use the total general revenue uh, and then add to the, remember we have the negative 3 billion, remember, on the top panel. And then we get the change in net position. And then we have the beginning balance, meaning for May 31st, uh, uh, from last uh, wait, from last June 30th, 2020, right? That's, that's uh, the beginning balance. Or you can say July 1st, 2020, that's the beginning of this year, right? So that's the beginning balance of the net position plus the changes in that position will give us this fiscal year ending balance for that position. So let's see the numbers on the second page. You see, this, this, these are the numbers for uh, what we just talked about, right? So you see that uh, the total general revenue actually is three trillion. That's a relief, right? <laughs> Remember the top panel, we have like huge deficit, right? Just because we have the expense, all the expenses, but we subtract the program revenue, right? But you can see that we actually rely, the city of Boston rely heavily on general revenue, right? Mainly taxes, right? To cover uh, the expenses, right? So after we add that part, the changes in that position, now it becomes positive, 56 million. You see that? And then plus the beginning balance of the negative 1.1 uh, trillion, and then we get the uh, around like a 1 trillion negative uh, balance for that position. So this is a statement of uh, activities. That's, that's the entity wide. And now we enter what? Uh, found financial statements. Everyone see it? On the right hand side, we see found financial statements. And, and the title of the statement on the right-hand side, you can see that this is for the governmental funds balance sheet. Governmental funds uh, use modified accrual basis. So it's a different basis of accounting. Uh, but balance sheet, as we mentioned before, right? Balance sheet uh, is, is a snapshot um, of the financial position of those funds. And so the timestamp is just one day. So you can see actually, um, yeah, this statement actually is a fit, uh, fits um, in, uh, in one page. So what do we see here? Um, assets, yeah. Assets on the left-hand side, then on the right-hand side we have, I mean, now they put it um, in order to put in one page, right? They put vertically, which is fine. So assets equal to liability plus deferred inflow of resources plus fund balances. Fund balances is equivalent to net position from what we, we saw um, earlier. So, so that's the structure of uh, balance sheet. And, uh, um, and we know that governmental funds include um, several funds, right? Five major funds, right? General funds, right? Uh, special revenue funds. General funds take care of the day-to-day -day, uh, governmental activities. Uh, special revenue uh, funds that uh, uh, is used for special purpose. Um, capital project funds ca uh, helps to handle acquisition of uh, fixed assets, like buildings, equipment, right? Um, and there are permanent funds. Um, and uh, that that um, that handles the permanent uh, permanent permanent like endowment, right? Those type of fund. And there's also debt service fund. Debt service fund handles the um, the like uh, uh, repaying long-term loans, uh, interest payments, right? Those type. But 
as you notice that you know the debt service fund and uh, uh, permanent fund actually is now showing as a separate column, right? Is actually grouped together under the other governmental funds, right? Because uh, the fund statement actually follow the major fund structure. Only the funds that qualify to be major structure can be listed separately. Uh, as you can see, general, special revenue, capital project uh, are listed as major funds as separate columns, right? Uh, one thing uh, I want to mention is general fund, regardless whether they meet the criteria, major fund criteria or not, it's always listed as um, a major fund column. So they always list it separate because each government has one and only one general fund. So, and handles day-to-day -day operations. So uh, it's, a, it's an exception. Uh, and then uh, the last column is the total. So you add all these columns together. And so we have the total assets, you know, you can see for governmental funds is roughly uh, 2.5 billion, right? Um, and liabilities, um, again, you have the liabilities uh, columns and uh, I mean, liabilities, like different type of liabilities, right? And then uh, again, for, for different funds, right? And then we can see the total liabilities is roughly seven hundred seven seventy seven million dollars, right? Uh, deferred inflow of uh, resources, uh, forty million dollars, and the fund balances um, is about one point seven billion, right? And so, you if you add liability plus deferred inflow of resources uh, plus the uh, fund uh, balances. Um, you get the 2.55 uh, billion. So that's why it's called a balance. Left hand side equal to right hand side, right? And it give us give us a snapshot of a financial position. Like you know what resources we have on this day, what liabilities we have we need to meet on this day, no matter it's current or long term what financial cushions we have, which is a fund balance, right? So this is the balance sheet for government fund. Um, and reconciliation of the balance sheet, I and mean, for the sake of time, you know, we don't, we don't talk about that. Um, and statement of revenue expenditures and changes in fund balance. Again, this is for government funds and uh, the structure is uh, fairly uh, straightforward. We have revenues and expenditures. And remember, we are dealing with government funds, which use uh, modified accrual, right? In modified accrual, expenses are called expenditures, right? Uh, that's just only one uh, like um, difference. There are so many uh, different uh, rules that we don't have time to cover, but uh, uh, just give you an idea, right? And again, this follow the major fund structure, right? So uh, you can see that, you know, uh, special revenue, capital projects, are major funds, and general is always be listed as major funds. So total revenue for this tax year for City of Boston, for the governmental funds is 4.1 uh, billion, right? And total expenditures is uh, 4.46 billion, and so, uh, when you use the revenue minus expenses, you get uh, the excess, uh, basically deficiency, deficit, or surplus, right? So in this year, uh, City of Boston government funds actually have a uh, deficiency of $295 million, right? And then there's other financing uh, sources, uh, typically involve some like uh, uh, long-term debt, right? Uh, um, so, like borrowing, right? And uh, and so if we um, add this part and we get the net change in fund balance, uh, sixty negative sixty um, million dollars, and plus the beginning balance of the fund balance, and we get ending balance of one point seven uh, billion. So that's uh, 
statement of uh, revenue expenditure and changes in fund uh, balances. Typically, I mean, um, it's it's pretty much the statement of activities. Uh, so this is governmental uh, governmental fund statement, and again, there's reconciliation. Um, you know, I, I don't want to <laughs> get into too much detail with that. Um, and so here, next statement, statement of revenue expenditures and budgetary basis. This is actually um, the budgetary comparison that we talk about in the other required supplementary information. Remember that we talked the major component, components. And so uh, here you can see uh, they have revenues, expenditures, right? Um, and then original budget and a final budget, and then the actual spending, right? Re actual revenue uh, spending, and then the favorable and favorable variance, right? If we receive more resources, then that's favorable. If we spend more than what we budget, then that's unfavorable, right? So, and then we compare the previous year's actual. So that's, this is called a comparative uh, budgetary schedule, which is uh, required supplementary information. It just help us to plan for uh, next next year. Uh, then the next uh, set uh, is still under the fund financial statements. It, this is now the statement of net position for proprietary fund. Uh, proprietary fund means um, those are the funds that um, means the those are the sub entities that carry out business like activities for City of Boston. So they use accrual basis of accounting. And the statement on that position, again, is equivalent to balance sheet, right? And by now you probably get idea, oh, you know, yeah, it's, you know, assets on the left-hand side, right? Equal to liability plus net position. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and statement of revenue expense changes in that position, that's activity statement for the proprietary funds, right? And uh, um, so, we have operating revenue, that's the employer, employee contribution, employer contribution. And then we have the expenses, that's uh, health benefits. Um, that means that the benefits that the city of Boston covered, right? And that's the uh, expense. So the net, the operating uh, loss that we have, right? Which is about uh, uh, 3.9 uh, million, right? For this year. And then plus the beginning balance, we get the ending balance of that position about ninety-seven uh, million dollars. Okay. Then uh, statement of cash flow again is for proprietary fund. So statement of cash flow uh, tells us um, again it's a video tells us um, the cash inflows, cash outflows that happened during the fiscal year. And uh, it answers the viability question, right? Like, you know, because the cash is the blood for operation, right? So without cash, it's hard to carry uh, carry on uh, with the operations. Um, so we have the cash inflows from operating activities, cash received from employees and employers, cash paid for uh, vendors. And so that's from operating activities. Um, and, uh, so that's, you know, we have actually positive uh, cash, net cash from operating activities. That's 20, like close to $24 million, right? Then there's the beginning uh, balance of cash. Um, and then there's ending, right? You pass the beginning balance, we get ending balance. Uh, here, it's only from operating activities, but um, oftentimes also have some other activities like uh, for this year, it's, you know, City of Boston only have operating activities. Maybe for other years, you know, it will have investing activities, mainly buying, selling the fixed assets, right? Or, or, or investments. Uh, or maybe there are some financing activities, maybe like borrowing, right? Uh, issuing bond, right? Uh, so, but, but in this year, only operating activities. Um, uh, the cash flow only uh, occurred in the operating activities. Oh, at the bottom here, reconciliation. So 
it's only because um, the top part used a uh, direct method to prepare the cash flow from all pretty activities. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Gatsby does not require reconciliation now, but it's probably just they have the template. They just use it anyway and, and as a double check, you know. So they include uh, reconciliation using indirect method, meaning they work backwards from uh, from the bottom line of uh, the statement of activities. Remember, do you remember 3.9 negative from the previous statement, right? And the, they reverse, reverse engineer back to, this is like a crew basis um, income, right? And they reverse engineer to cash basis of income which is what, 23, um, 23 million, right? From the operating activities, you see the same here, right? So that just verified what we got from the uh, cash flow from operating activities uh, is correct. So this is cash flow statement for proprietary fund. Um, and then uh, another set of the, uh, found uh, uh, found statement is for fiduciary funds. Fiduciary funds means uh, the government, the city of Austin, act like either a trust or an agent. Uh, so, uh, meaning what? Meaning these resources do not belong to the city of Austin, belongs to the beneficiaries. For example, trust um, mainly means that uh, the, like you know, City of Boston manage the 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 pension pension fund, right? Pension fund is a typical uh, trust fund, and then uh, also the OPEP, right? Other post employment benefits uh, trust fund, right? So that's you know pension and the OPEP trust, uh, and they also have the private purpose trust, right? So those are the two. The sec the first two columns are the trust fund, and then. Uh, agency fund. It's also it's recent in recent years. It's renamed as custodial funds. But you know they just want to avoid uh, some confusion because government has a lot of agent, right? So they want to avoid the, the confusion. But uh, ultimately, it, it is agent agent uh, agency fund. Meaning what? City of Boston simply act like a path through entity. So for example. A private donate, uh, private foundation give some nonprofit organizations through City of Austin some, you know, grants, right? So these, uh, this money simply just like handled by City of Austin as pass through entity and and go directly to the nonprofit organization. So uh, therefore. All the numbers on the fiduciary funds are not included in the entity-wide statements because these resources do not belong to city of Boston. Make sense? So, uh, so uh, again, so this is the statement of uh, fiduciary net position. Again, you see the structure, uh, assets on the left-hand side, right? Um, and then on the right-hand side, we have liabilities and plus net position. Right, similar structure as as we saw, and we have the, the first two columns: pension, OPEP trust, and private purpose trust, and then the agency fund, custodial funds, right, in a third column, and then the last column is a total. So, um, and uh, so this is the the structure of the statement of net position for fiduciary funds, and then. Uh, the next statement is statement of changes in fiduciary net position for fiduciary funds. And uh, the structure is very simple, right? Additions, that's include the contributions. Um, that means, uh, you know, the, the pension, right? Contributions from city of Boston and also from employee, right? Employees actually put in uh, contributions towards uh, their pension as well. And investment earnings, um, security lending activities, and then there are some deductions. Deductions, uh, like, you know, they have to, CDA has to pay benefits, right? Uh, pension benefits, you know, all this um, uh, deductions, you know, so we use additions minus deductions 
we get the changes in that position, which is represented here, right? The totals, which is the about one billion, right? One point one billion dollars, uh, and beginning balance is eight point two. So the total net position uh, for this um, tax year is for this fixable year is nine point three billion dollars. So this is uh, the state of changes in fiduciary in that position. Yeah, I think this is, you know, and then, then we start the, the, the notes, right? So, um, I mean, when you have time, uh, you always want to read notes, you know, just a lot of fun fact, right? So for example, here, they actually said city of Boston incorporated as a town, 1630, right? As a city, 1822. That's just a like fun fact, right? Uh, obviously have a lot of details about counting methodologies they use, and uh, a lot of details of uh, the calculations. Um, but that's you know that's the uh, that's the major financial statements that I want to go over. And I hope uh, this is helpful. Any questions? Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. I personally um, learned a lot just in that short amount of time. I can say that. Um, for my other maybe reporter colleagues on the call that it's uh, not surprising at all that the city of Boston would present it in a way that's not super clear. Like if I saw that document, I probably wouldn't know for a long time that I was supposed to read the two pages next to each other. And I'd be wondering just why they're floating unlabeled numbers. So that was super helpful. Um, yeah, if, if there's any questions, um, you can either drop them in the chat or uh, I think ask permission to unmute and we can let you ask them in person. I'll Pause for that. Um, maybe I'll ask if uh, if you've read um, stories like this, like if you follow the news about budgets, municipal budgets, state budgets. Are there things that you notice that reporters tend to get wrong? Um. Well. Um... The thing is that um, for for verifying this, um, it actually requires a lot of uh, calculations. Mm -hmm. So um, without access to you know a lot of like you know the like especially for budgetary information, right? It's not always like uh, public information, right? Uh, it's it, it's probably uh, public in, inside the government, but may not be. Uh, public, you know, in, in the report, especially a lot of news um, uh, came like in, in a very brief format, right? So uh, it would be hard without any data, you know, to to, uh, to to say it's correct or not. You know, um, we actually uh, develop cases, you know, me and my co-author actually did develop like uh, teaching cases, uh, which, you know, uh, I developed, you know, Quite a few cases, um, uh, which was published in an issue in accounting uh, education, which is a premier uh, pedagogical uh, journal. And so we ask a student to analyze, for example, the city of Boston. We ask a student to analyze um, the financial performance. And so uh, there are there are a lot of ratios that. Um, can measure the profitability, even though the profits are not uh, the goal of the government, right? We, uh, we have ratios to measure the efficiency, uh, and we have ratios to measure the, uh, like the risk, right? Like financial risk, uh, whether they can cover the short-term um, obligations, um, liquidity ratio, uh, or long-term. Right, whether they can co cover long-term debt, like solvency ratios. So, uh, and based on the ratios and trend, and students um, also, you know, can compare with a, a comparable city, and uh, just to to see which city is doing better. And uh, um, so things like that. Uh, it really requires a lot of uh, calculation in before uh, anyone can jump. Uh, into any conclusion or inference, uh, whether, you know, this is right or not. 
Gotcha. Yeah. Um, if there are no more questions, um, we can we can wrap up. Ted unfortunately had to uh, jump off the call. He's a new father, so he left to go um, be with his family. But thank you so much, um, Dr. Nancy Fang, for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you to our participants. Um, once again, this was an, an event sponsored by the New England chapter of the Society for Professional Journalists. We host these events sometimes, so you should always um, be checking our Facebook page and our Twitter uh, if you're interested in more events like this. Um, but thank you so much for coming, and we will wrap it up there. I wish everyone a very good night. Yeah, good night. Thank you.